Today on The Anxious Truth, we're going to look at the difference between success in recovery and the struggle in recovery, because they're not as different as you might think. We're going to get a little nerdy with some brain stuff that I think you're going to like, because I know I do. So let's get going. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 197, recorded February of 2022. If you are new to the podcast, I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety and anxiety recovery. So if you are struggling with things like panic attacks or agoraphobia, you're afraid to leave your house, OCD, social anxiety, health anxiety, this is the place for you. I'm glad that you are here. And of course, if you are a returning listener or a viewer on YouTube, welcome YouTube, then I'm certainly glad you're here. Welcome back and thanks for taking the time to hang out with me for another week. Today, we're going to talk about some of the differences or one possible difference between success and recovery and the times when we struggle in recovery. Because believe it or not, success and struggle look very similar for a lot of people, not everybody for a lot of people. And we're going to talk about one possible reason for that. What What's the demarcation line between succeeding and struggling? So we're gonna look at that. But before we do, I will take a, a minute or two here to remind you that the anxious truth is more than just this podcast episode. So if you are new here, and this is your first listen, again, welcome, but go to the anxious truth.com where you will find the three books that I have written on anxiety and anxiety recovery that everybody seems to really be uh, getting a lot of use out of I'm really proud of those books. And they seem really helpful. So go check those out at the anxious truth.com if you do not know of my books. And also you'll find all of my social media links, there's just a ton of free information that I put out all the time on, on the different social channels. So go check that out, especially the Anxious Morning, which is a free email newsletter that shows up in your mailbox every morning when you wake up, unless you're down under, and then in which case you're going to get it in the afternoon. Uh, but it's a little three to 500 word email that shows up every Wednesday, Monday through Friday, with a little three to five minute podcast attached to it. And that is the favorite thing that I do right now. It is the best work I've ever created, I think, in this space. And everybody that's reading the emails and listening to that little mini podcast seems to really love it. So go check that out. That's 100% free. You can find that at theanxiousmorning.com or theanxiousmorning.email, either way. So go check it all out. Avail yourself of all the resources, because this is why I do this. I want to try and help. So let's talk about the difference between success in recovery and the times when we kind of struggle in recovery. Because believe it or not, for many people, not everybody, so this isn't going to apply to everybody, but for many people, if you look at what it looks like, it looks very similar. So succeeding and struggling looks from the outside in like two very similar things. Hear me out. Somebody who is making progress, we would say maybe succeeding in recovery, or they're, or they're progressing down the road toward they want, where they want to be. They're working the process and they're working it hard. So we talk about this all the time. This is difficult work. This is scary work. We're intentionally doing hard things. We always acknowledge that. None of this is a, a walk in the park ever. This is difficult work. So those people that are succeeding or getting further down the road, they are out there doing the work. They're doing it consistently. They're doing it tenaciously. They're doing it incrementally and systematically, and they have a plan, and they execute it. They're doing all that stuff. And, and they're making some progress, and that's great. And if you're one of those people, I'm applauding you, and I'm reading, rooting for you. Keep going down the road, man. You can do it. Other people that are maybe struggling with recovery might look very similar, right? So I'm doing, and this is a thing we hear all the time in the community, I don't avoid anything. I'm doing all the things. I do all the things, but yet nothing is changing. I feel like I'm not getting any better. What's the matter? What's going on? And it's true. If you look at that person, they would look very similar to the person who is saying that they're progressing or succeeding in their recovery. Their activities look very similar. They get up, they go to work, they go to school, they take care of their families. They're, they're, it looks like they're living life. And the struggling person will say, I am doing all the things, Drew. Like, why is it not getting better? Here's one possible reason why. So let's get a little nerdy with some brain stuff because I'm a huge fan of the brain. It's amazing. So there's a part of your brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And the, we're not going to get so technical on here, but the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is generally associated with kind of filtering. So it's sort of the importance and attention filter, if you will. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and I'm not going to say that anymore because that's a mouthful and I'm going to screw it up. Uh, but that part of your brain is responsible for filtering, generally speaking, and deciding where your attention is going to go. Like, I'm going to let this in, but I'm not going to let that in. I'm going to filter this out, but not that. So it's kind of, in really layman's terms, starting to become pretty acknowledged as sort of like a filter. It decides what is important or not, what it decides for us, what we're going to think about, what we're going to consider, 
when we make our decisions. It, it's sort of like the gatekeeper to the, to the brain or the gatekeeper to your cognition might be a little bit more accurate. I don't know. It's a, pretty fascinating to me. I don't claim to be an expert, but some of the research and the studies that are being done in this area are pretty, um, pretty cool. And I got this, uh, kind of took this out of some studies that are happening, believe it or not, in the business world. Like, what's the difference between the entrepreneur that successfully builds that big business and goes public and cashes out and everybody thinks that's great, and the entrepreneur that fails, you know, or the company that fails? What's the difference? Well, they look the same. Right. So in business, that person has to work hard. They are dedicated to their idea. They don't take no for an answer. They keep going. They're tenacious. They get other people to follow along with them and they succeed. But guess what? Giant epic business failures have the same characteristics in terms of operationally. Generally speaking, committed to the idea, work really hard, won't take no for an answer, keep they persevere. They won't be they won't be denied. They get people to work with them, but they fail at an epic scale, sometimes at a huge, spectacular, flame at explosive kind of scale of those failures. So the behaviors are the same. What's the difference? Well, sometimes the difference is the information that's allowed into the decision making process as we go. So if we if we talk about that in terms of recovery, and the role of that that brain filter, the gatekeeper, if you will, the dorsolateral lateral prefrontal cortex, somebody should write a song about that, because it just sounds so melodic could be part of this. And in recovery, I think the difference is the the person who is achieving what they would say would be success. And this is very subjective, of course, we're going to define that slightly differently. But the person who says, hey, this is working, I'm starting to get better, I'm seeing improvement, I'm loving it, and they keep going, that person is allowing information in to their cognitive mechanism, the machine up here, that's a little bit different than the struggling person. That person is willing to take the lesson that, say, the exposures, the challenges, the hard, scary things are providing. And I've talked about this before. I've done whole podcast episodes on this, refusing to learn the lessons of recovery. And, you know, the, the story that you tell yourself after your exposures and your challenges, which I wrote about in The Anxious Truth very extensively. Like, these are the critical parts. And when people say to me, I'm doing all the things, but it's not really working, what's the matter? We will often look at, yes, but tell me what the experience is after you do the things or during the things. What does what your experience look like? That's where you start to find the difference because the person who's progressing down the path to recovery will say things like, well, it was this is really hard and I'm really scared right now, but I, but I know why I'm doing this, paraphrasing. I know I'm doing this and my job is to allow this all to happen so I can move through it. Whereas the person who is struggling recovery is doing the same exact activity, sometimes the exact same activity, the supermarket, the mailbox, going, you know, driving on the highway. We're all familiar with these common life activities. The struggling person is doing those same activities, except their cognition is based more on, it feels like I think I'm going to, this is super scary, this is hell, this is really hard. Now, we can never fully share another person's experience. I can't be in your head, you can't be in mine, so I can't really tell exactly what you're experiencing. That's true. But if you take two people in a very similar context, one is progressing, one is feels like they're stuck and struggling. What's the difference? That seems to be the difference. And that might be a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex filter function. Like what, what am I going to let in? What is my filter? What is the gate tuned to let in or not let in? Now, if all you're going to do, if your filter is tuned right now to say, I'm going to drop all of the good stuff on the floor, which is nothing bad actually happened to me. I was in fact capable. I did handle it. I did cope because these are the common struggle statements. It feels like I can't handle it. I don't know how I'm going to cope. I'm worried that I'm never going to get better. So the reality of the situation is, and I, I post about this on our social media all the time, you always have handled it. You always have coped. You always have been okay. You always have gotten through but the filter, the gatekeeper in your brain, the cognitive gatekeeper is deciding, no, no, I'm not going to care about that information. The only information I'm going to let in is the information that says, this is scary. This is hell. This is too, too difficult. It's too much. I'm going to snap. It feels like it feels like it feels like. So there's definitely a difference in, in what information is going into the machine here to process that experience during and after, say, the exposure or the challenge. Whereas... The person who's progressing recovery is going to say, yes, I do acknowledge it's really scary and I have all these thoughts and everything, but I have, uh, they're going to let, the filter is going to let reality come through and get factored into that. 
so that the story that they tell after the exposure is, that was really hard, that was really scary, but I did it. You know, I did it, I'm okay, and what did I learn from this? It's not always that smooth, it's not always that easy, let's be very clear about that. Everybody stumbles, everybody struggles, everybody falls back to old habits sometimes, so don't, you know, I'm not trying to just describe like, oh, as soon as you change your filter, everything just goes great. It's a struggle for everybody, it's up and down, it's not linear, we know all that. But the difference seems to be, at least when you talk about it in these terms, that the person who is progressing is allowing reality to get through the brain filter, if you will, and become part of that inner discussion that that creates what the experience is after. How are you going to tell the story afterwards? How are you going to what experience are you going to take out of that that situation out of that challenge out of that, you know, exposure, whatever it happens to be? Well, if, if your brain is tuned right now to do nothing, but it's going to filter out reality and only let in the bad stuff and the oh my god, it felt like stuff, then yeah, it's really hard to progress. And you wind up in a situation where you say, well, I think I'm doing it. I'm accepting, I'm not avoiding, I'm doing things, I'm, I'm floating, however way you want to describe it to me, yet I'm not getting better. Look at that. Like, well, where is my attention all the time? And this is not a thing we can necessarily, you're not choosing to do that, by the way. This is not what am I paying attention to. But that filter exists for all of us, what we decide is worthy of getting into going into the math. You know, so if you look at all of your, if you look at cognition as math, which it's not, I'm using an example here, but and you're solving life math, and you're doing your equations to come to your conclusions and, and form your perception of your experiences, then that filter that we talked about, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just I'm getting good at saying that, um, is, is really kind of involved in deciding, well, which variables am I going to plug into this equation to solve this math to come up with some conclusion from this experience. And for people who are struggling, the only variables that get let in through the filter are the negative ones, how bad it felt, what they thought was going to happen how uncomfortable they were. Those are the only variables that go into the math. So they have they have the same experience physically as the the recovering person or the person who's advancing down the road. Yet their math in their head that equation gets solved very differently based on a different set of variables that get plugged in. And you get two completely different outcomes. That was really scary. But I did it. And I'm okay. And oh, my God, this is amazing. I learned something I can't wait to do it tomorrow again, is, is for, you know, one person's response. And the other person's response is, it felt like it was going to pass out, I have to hang on to the shopping cart, I had to call my husband, I had to drive home. This is terrible. It's awful. I can't get it. I'm never going to get better. Same exact experience, two very different descriptions. And we might argue we I'm just throwing this out here. This is stuff for us to think about, we might argue that that was based on the, the different variables that got plugged into the equation. What does your filter look like? You know, what what does your filter look like? And in the end, I think you find people who begin to say, well, okay, I'm going to sort of embrace this process. I'm going to do this stuff that you talk about. I got it. I'm on board. You avail yourself of all the psychoeducation. Now I know what I have to do, even though I don't want to. At some point, that filter does change. Now, let's, let's throw some stuff against the wall here. Uh, this is not therapy. This is not medical advice. I cannot, I'm not giving you like bona fide neuroscience here that you should hang your hat on and say, Drew said this is exactly what happens. But let's throw some stuff out and talk about a few things. My friend Bridget Cooper, you've seen her on the podcast, Dr. Dr. B, she likes to use different operators, like uh, Boolean operators in her statements when she coaches people and she helps people in her writing. Uh, and she's brilliant. I love Dr. B. She likes to use and, but, right? So those are powerful words. Yes, and, but these are good, good words. Now, I, I am uh, not a fan of but because but is usually used in the negative. But if you find that your filter right now is set to only plug in the negative variables to your, your life math, if you will, then one tool that you might use, stolen right out of Dr. B, you can find her at drbridgetcooper.com, is using the words and, but. So look at these two examples. The person who is succeeding in their recovery might say, or moving down the road, might give you this, or let's, let's talk about the struggling person first. The struggling person will say, that was terrible. It felt like I was going to die. That was hell. Those are three really powerful statements that would absolutely not make you want to do that again and would, and would tell somebody listening that like, oh, you're not getting better at all. But somebody who is maybe working on tuning their filter a little different and allowing reality to factor in might say, that was terrible and I was terrified, but nothing happened and I was okay. So one of the things that I'm really fond of saying is always finish the statement. 
So the person who is allowing reality in through the filter in their brain and allowing reality to become part of part of the experience will always finish the statement. I was really scared, but I did it anyway, and nothing happened to me. That is tremendously powerful where the person who's still struggling might be having the same physical experiences, but will end the statement after the first part of the sentence. That was really terrible. I was terrified. And they end the statement. They don't finish it. So use end and but to your advantage there. Well, what can I tack to the end of that statement? Oh, and I was okay, but nothing happened to me. Those can be really useful. And that starts to at least acknowledge, oh, I'm filtering out all the good stuff here. How can I actively bring the good stuff back in here? I could do it by using those kind of statements. All right, so this is not anything earth shattering, I believe. It's just another way to frame it in some instances, another way to approach it. But if you find that, yeah, I get it, Drew, like I'm, I'm focused on the negative, but what do I do? How can I not be negative because it feels so bad? Well, try that. Try finishing the statement. So instead of that was awful, it felt like I was going to pass out and being stuck there and stopping and then throwing your hands up and saying, well, it's just too much for me. I can't, I can't possibly forget that part. Well, I'm not telling you to forget the negative part. You can't forget it if you wanted to, but you can open up that filter a little bit in your brain and allow the reality to seep in by finishing the statement with things like and and but. That was terrible. I was terrified. I thought that I was going to die, but nothing happened and I was okay or and I am okay now and I did it. But I learned that I was wrong again. My brain was wrong again. Finish the statement. That is a way to maybe to begin to tune that filter a little bit differently. So if you are in the struggle camp right now and you don't understand why you're doing all the things, but nothing is changing, consider that you may have a filter that's tuned to only allow the negative into, the, into your processing process, the processing machinery in your head. Like gross oversimplification, but this might help you if you think of it that way. Oh wait, my filter is tuned very finely right now to drop all of the positive and only allow the negative in. What can I do? Oh, let me go out and grab the positive by using words like end and but. And I wound up okay, but nothing actually happened. Try it. It could be a, a big difference. It may start to help you shift that a little bit. And trust me, in the beginning, you're not really believing it so much. I know you're not, but that's okay. The belief comes after we do it. So there you go. That's the difference between, or one possible difference, between why some people may be moving forward sometimes in recovery, while other people may be doing the exact same things, yet feel like they are struggling. Right? Remember your friend the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, remember that it filters your experience and decides what to let in to your equations and not. And if you find that, oh, my equations are always based on negative variables, what can I do? Let me add words like end or but, thank you, Dr. B. Like, how can I finish the statements? And in that case, you're reaching out from behind the filter, grabbing a big dose of reality and dragging it in and plugging it into the math. So it's a little bit more of an active process. Try it. You never know. That might change things for you. So I love this sort of stuff. And we will talk about it some more. I'm sure we will down the road. But uh, I just want to say dorsolateral prefrontal cortex more and more and more because I thought I didn't want to say it, but now I want to say it all the time. I'm a little bit obsessed. Anyway, guys, that's the episode. That is episode 197. I hope it's been helpful. You know it's over because the music, which is Afterglow by Ben Drake. Ben actually wrote this song inspired by a very early episode of the podcast and some of the things that I've written and said. And he was kind enough to let me use this uh, as the intro and outro music. You can find Ben and all of his work at bendrakemusic.com. He's a good dude. Tell him that I said hello. What else do I tell you at the end? Oh, that's right. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, any place where you can rate or review the podcast, then leave a five-star rating and maybe write a quick review because it helps other people find the podcast. And then we get to help more people, which is great. And if you're watching on YouTube, then hit the subscribe button, like the video, leave a comment. I am so proud of myself because I'm actually answering YouTube comments now for the past week. You guys are awesome. I'm sorry I ignored you for so long. So leave a comment, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and that's it. If you read my books and you dig them, go write a review on Amazon. That helps me out. And if you want to find a way to support this work and keep it ad-free, go to theanxioustruth.com slash support. You can check out all the ways you can help me out. That's it. See you guys next week. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I will be here. And remember, this is the way. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance. So go and live your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push through the pressure like an atom bomb. You keep on dancing like